that was one of my favorite stories. And I thought it was so encouraging because you had shared how for the past five years. I can't share that story. I, I mean, my PR people, my office offices don't talk about that because it gets you very emotional. <laughs> and it's embarrassing because you're supposed to be this hard festival director. No. And suddenly you just melt. Whenever I think about that, it just sends me into this really emotional space of how meaningful my work is. Yeah. And I made that one boy happy. Was this the guy that made you go, this is what I want to do? Because the first few years you were trying to figure out and just hold a festival, hold a festival, right? And eventually you made that realization. That but even, even, even nine years, it was still hold the festival, hold the festival, just finish it, do it. But when I reflect and look back why I do the festival, it will be this really, really, it's not the big people that you meet. It's the small people that really moved me. Like I did a festival in Batworth and this couple came up to me and asked to take a picture with me. And I felt like a rock star. Like, wow, do you want to take a picture with me? And then it's in the middle of nowhere. And I said, oh, how did you know about this? She said, oh, we stumbled upon it last year. So we came back this year. And that's when you start to feel really good that real people really appreciate your work. And they didn't have to be nice to me. They didn't know who I was or didn't, I didn't know who they were. They didn't have to say nice things. But that's what moves me most when people I don't know touch with me. Do people normally stop you in the streets? Sometimes. Sometimes. I, I get a kick out of it because it's like me wanting to be Mother Teresa. There's a side of me that wants to teach her. When people do that, it makes you feel justified that you are a good person. You mentioned the Butterworth Fringe Festival, which is like a 20-minute fairy ride array. And it's quite similar yes. to George China as well, right? So was it an interesting challenge if you were to hold it together? It was an interesting challenge. It was a real challenge because the place that we were bringing this festival to was really in the middle of nowhere. It wasn't an attractive space, but it's. I put it down to like something that I enjoyed doing. It was a challenge. I might not want to do it again. It was interesting. I, I liked it. And one of the things I wanted to bring up was Haiki Sing Lo because I talked to Tiong Hing about this. It's his semi-autobiography and it was because of that performance at George Sun that he even managed to make it into a film and it's just really... So incredible to see the impact. So what was it like from your perspective, just getting Tiong Hing to come in and host this performance? Tiong Hing's a friend and he did Emily for me in the first year. And then I think two or three years later, he did Silat. I think he's incredibly talented. And I, I know of this film that he's been wanting to do. And then I remember we talked about this and I said, why don't you put it into a play? And I think he was trying to find funding for the film. And I'm glad he did the play because I think everybody that walked away from that play cried. It was that moving. And this was like hot, sweltering Kukong Sea. People were sitting on benches, but it was such a moving show. And I, I think that's probably, to me, one of his best work, even better than the film. It was so moving. I remember I cried and I remember seeing people crying as they came out of the thing. I thought, wow, this is so moving, you know? I, I kind of like gospel songs and I think he finished with Amazing Grace and it's such a mo moving song and it was just the on point song to use at the very last bit, you know, clever. I thought it was beautiful as well that just before that there was a giant storm and everything was torn up and they were panicking to put it all together by it worked out in Get. Yes, the night before it was pouring with rain, dress rehearsal. It was pouring with rain and backstage those puddles and umbrellas and all that. And I've always believed that I'm very lucky that the whole nine years of Georgetown Festival, we never had the rain. We used, not witch doctors, they called it, I can't remember. They had, they had a very clever word for it. And I, every year I consulted the same man. His sister, he's died since. But he always held the rain away. We're the consultant, we call him. <laughs> and I believe Kang also helped co-produce two houses. What was that like? Yeah. Two Houses came from me talking to King's husband, Yu Bing. We talked about, when I was younger, I used to go to this old house that is this character who was like, very much like Quentin Crisp. I don't know whether you know Quentin Crisp. He, he did. He was very famous as the first English poofter. And he went to America and was celebrated because he never dusted. He was witty, clever. And John Hurt did a film called The Naked Civil Servant. And I used to go to this house and this person would hold court. And I would hear the stories of the rich people in Penang, the rich families. And I often wonder, wouldn't it be wonderful to put it in a play? So then along came Yu Bing. So he did two houses. It's centered around the stories of two families. And then I think a few years later, he did uh, Pearl at the Eastern and Oriental, also produced by King. And King, I think in 2012, I think, did something called Number 7 at the Blue Mansion. That's my relationship with King. Like, she was always there with great ideas. 
That's incredible. And I mean, like Blue Mansion is such a historical place as well in Penang. And I think that's what you always look for, something that's historical and meaningful. You get the cafes involved as well. So what is your thought process in finding all these unusual places to host this event? It's because Penang hasn't got huge performing halls and swanky galleries, but we have really nice spaces, raw places, beautiful historical buildings. Where in the world would you be given the two houses is a huge mansion? The owners gave it to us for one month and put aside a BBC production, a month for free. So it, only in Penang would owners give you houses or buildings or streets or walls without that price tag. Only in Penang. That's why I said, how can I not love the people of Penang or the, this village or the people or the government here? You know? It is a very different thing here than anywhere else. So there's an amazing thing of how the community comes and supports you. What are the big challenges that you face that people you feel don't normally see as you're going to host these things for them? Money. Money has always been the challenge. It costs a lot of money to run and put big productions. I'm still taking out arrows and knives from my back because villages tends to be backstabbing, small-mindedness. But I think if you listen to what Jesus said, forgive them, Lord, for did not know. The times that they threw knives at me is because they didn't know. So I am now working with people, with the very people that threw knives at me because I feel it, they don't know. That's why they threw knives at me. So that, that was challenging when people don't know and they just attack or they hit you or, and they don't take the trouble to find out. I, I'm quite a nice person, I think. But they, they just blindly accuse me of not supporting local because they don't come to me. They don't talk to me. You know? I think it's also because it's a two-way thing. It's a lack of communication on both parts. I'm now learning that I also have to learn to open up more maybe or talk in a different language or open my eyes a bit more. A enjoying this whole year has been looking at local, local, local because you can't travel, you can't look global and you start to appreciate and think what could you do with things around you? And it's an exciting challenge. A challenge in a good way, not challenge in a negative way, but challenge in a very positive and productive way. So how has it been with COVID coming down? Impact. I mean, like your work is very much meeting in person it was very hard because come 2020 i didn't have a project i had three staff and we had no projects for the whole year i i had to let go one i kept two it, it's just been really really hard but it's not anything special i think other people would have had it just as hard or even harder so it's an industry that you think your industry is hardly hit but what about people who own hotels or the five that lost his job so everybody had it hard so I think that no one is special here. That's why I feel sometimes the arts community keeps saying, oh, the government should do something. The government needs to feed fathers that have five children first, rather than artists. I think, I don't know. But I think it's the me culture that is very wrong, where it's always about me, 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 me. If you're a performer in America, there are no grants. You have to go out there and be a waiter and earn money and fund your own shows and fund your own music careers. Here we think, oh, if there's money, we'll do the project. If there's no money, no project. So there goes the missing thing which I feel missing here that it is hard work you need to put in the blood sweat and tears do you think that COVID has changed the art community in an irreversible manner I hope so I really really sincerely hope so I hope people realize that if you were producing bad work and you didn't get any help and your work didn't get pulled up the help is just for you to survive not for you to continue doing bad work so that's the danger of the survival grants that Chandana is giving out and all that and people mistake it for oh I'm good that's why I'm, I'm getting this grant the government was just giving these grants to help you survive but I think we all should internalize and see that if we couldn't survive the COVID on artistic merit then maybe we were not good in the first place. So I think it's a time that people should reflect and use the COVID as a testing kit that you have to be good and you have to be even better when you come out of COVID. I'm sure you're keeping the pulse on what all the artists are doing as well. So do you have any particular examples of people that you see who have adapted really well that people could look to and be inspired by? I give this example regionally. There's a theatre company called Wild Rice with Ivan Heng. Yeah? And they're a 20-year-old company and when everybody went going online, everybody decided, oh, we'll just go online, we go online. And at that time, it was like April, May, June, right? The whole world was going online. And why would anybody pay any attention to your show? Because there's no brand loyalty. And there you get New York Metropolitan Opera and Saddles Wells and Cirque du Soleil giving free shows. So why would people pay 50 ringgit to see your shows? So that's the same benchmark that I'm asking people now. Build your brand, have brand loyalty, so that and have a strong story. Wild Rice, they, they were having 
thing, and I was very impressed. They had a gala ball, online gala ball, that they sold tickets for 1,000, 20,000, and 10,000, I think, for a table, 10,000, a table, 25,000, I think. And I thought, my God, they've built such good brand loyalty. And whenever they stream their live shows, they had a lot of eyeballs from 35 countries because their shows were good, because they built the brand, because they have a story. And I think people need to really benchmark yourself, like, how good are you really? Or are we just Juara Kampong? Without naming names, I always look and ask, what was that all about? And I wonder whether these people who run these events or festivals ask the same question. How many people your festival was about? Was there anybody outside your circle of friends or outside Malaysia that picked up on that festival? So these are like questions like I recently stepped out of the Penang Museum Board because I felt we failed as museum board directors. We failed because we didn't do good work. So I'm always continuously putting my own report card. And I think people should have a report card and really know whether you fail. And if you did, and you did fail, it's fine failing, but change and not think that you were right. It's easy to compare now, especially you can switch online and you can compare yourself with the world. And you really can sit there and look at, my God, that's global standard. And am I really that good? And you mentioned building brand name. How does one do that when everyone's going online, everyone is doing something? How do you stand out? Having your own story, not copy. Be original. Use uh, material that you own or you make or you create quirky title. Have good imagery because people remember good images. Have your own stamp. And that's something that I think I'm a monster to work for because I have designers who work for me and if I don't like a blue, they have to change it like 28 times until the right blue. And so you get artists that will cry because this is a monster. But I tell them, I say, it's not about me. It's your work. At the end of the day, the public is going to see you your work and get the name as an artist and you should take pride in that and I always use this like I'm 62 years old the last card should be mine and we can fight and argue and I like people to argue with me and they don't agree with my taste but I said the last one you just got to trust me because if I said no I think we stick to what I said in the first place you just have to trust me because I am 62 and I think the images I put out have been well received so that's the only thing that I'm really a stickler images and, and collaterals and aesthetics I'm a stickler for that if I want a certain blue it has to be that blue or a yellow or a texture you know has there been any particular artist where you gave that critique and he really took him on board and really became so much better than what he was before? There is one Malay artist who I am a big fan of. He's very popular here, but I rejected his work twice. And because he's a cartoonist, he's an illustrator. And I rejected it because it didn't do anything for me. And about a year ago, we sat down for coffee and he told me, he said, I wrote to Mad Magazine and they gave me the same answers as you did that I wasn't good enough, my work wasn't this and that. And we've become very good friends, I like to say, you know. And I've always told him, I said, forget about the Malaysian Book of Records or the longest disc or coffee art or whatever. They're just all gimmicks. You want to stand out in the world. You want to be able to say your work stands out. And it's hard because I'm insecure. Like I told you, I'm shy, right? For many, many years, when I was invited overseas or to ask to speak, I felt really nervous. And it, it's very daunting when you meet Singaporeans wearing black isemiyaki and they know their work really well and they can expound about art or theatre and, and you don't. You just know what, what moves you and you're not that knowledgeable about the arts. And for many years, I felt, I wouldn't say small, I just felt very uncomfortable until the likes of King and people that I know overseas that tell me, God, Joe, you're, you're doing great work. You don't have to feel anywhere but intimidated by any of these people. I was intimidated by you spend six years in a circuit and you just got thrown into this festival circuit and you're finding your footing and you really don't know a lot of things. I still don't. And sometimes I used to think that I was a bit of a con man because I don't know stuff. I just know what I like. And that's very basic because I'm not knowledgeable. I'm not knowledgeable about music or theater or art. I just know, I cannot remember. I don't know some of these famous names or whatever, but I just know what I like. That's a human side, which I think has given me strength. And I always tell people, well, don't be like me and feel intimidated. Just be yourself. Embrace your human person. I mean, like you said, you don't know much, but I think a lot of people suffer from imposter syndrome. Do you think it's because of that genuine, deep in your core love for the arts that just kept you going and drove you to just always yeah. give your best? Yes, I just love it. I love to be exposed. I love learning. I love seeing new things. And every day I stumble upon things that... that gives me inspiration to create. Like I'm working on a music video when I was 17 or 16 or 15. There was this famous Indian actress called Zinat Aman and she starred in a movie called, I can't remember what it was called, I think it was called Domer Dom or something. The song was Domer Dom and it's been in my head for 40 years. So I hope maybe in June it'll come out. That's my bucket list. 
before June, you actually just finished the open weekend in Penang. How was that? Because it was meant yes. to be in 2020, right? And then COVID hit. Yeah, we, what happened was a group of friends, Alison who runs, you know, Narelle who runs China House, Nadia who runs Campbell Hotel. Friends asked me like, can you do something? You know, so we had the first meeting and I invited everybody to just voice out. And there was a lot of, I would say resentment. People wanted to do things, but they just don't know what to do. And I think it's the same. Everybody wants to sail their ship or their boats, but they need a captain. I was thrown into this and I believe that you need to have an armada that it doesn't matter whether you're a boat or a ship or but you need to sail together. And sometimes you need a captain to bring in all the people together. I feel as I'm lucky that I have that, I wouldn't say gift, the ability. So for those who want to become festival directors like yourself, what's your advice? Learn, make coffee for festival directors, be a slave, pick up the trades. And I did, I, I, I made coffee for people. It's nothing like learning and you cannot, like, I had one star who worked for me for two years. He was my protege, my blue-eyed boy, that I gave him a big show and it was something like six or eight hundred thousand dollars show. And after the whole festival, he brooded and said that, oh, I got all the credit when he did all the work. And after two years, he thought he was going to be a festival director. And I, I was very upset, actually. It hurt me because I never gave anyone else before him that sort of budget to run and he, he wasn't successful and yet I didn't take it out on him I took the blame you know the project wasn't good but I think people need to understand you need to pay your dues you need to be an apprentice you need to learn I'm 62 I told you I failed as a festival director 2001 was it yeah that's what 20 years ago when I was 40 I failed big time so young kids now must learn that they need to do their apprenticeship you just don't come out being a festival director some can and some are probably very good in their first go I had to learn and I think I wasn't good even with Georgetown Festival because they're looking back there are a lot of little weak holes I would call it little weak pieces where because I was just thrown into it and rushed nine years I didn't have time to reflect so I think it was a good thing that I didn't continue doing the festival that stopped me and I had to reflect and now I think the best is yet to come so having done the reflection, what do you think you would do differently moving forward? I have this project in my head, harboring for four years, that my father used to quote Ravina Tagore to me when I was about eight years old. And I thought, why is this man telling me this thing? And I never knew what it meant. But the last four years, I've been studying this thing about Asianism, like who we are, what's our history, and what is our pride. And I, I suddenly realized that even as a festival director, I was wrong. I put the Western psyche above our Asian psyche. We put the white man's idea of culture ahead of us. When India, China, Malays, and the Cambodians, we have historically thousands of years of culture. And yet when we look at art and culture, we put the Western man's psyche up before us. So I'm working on a project, an idea which is still inside me, called Festival of Asia. Because I feel like if you ask people about West Asia, a lot of people cannot tell you what is the demarcation of West Asia and who's in Asia and what is Asia. And when you look at it, we were civilized 2,000 years ago. In Bujan Valley, we were trading elephants to India. Right? So for 2000 years, Malaysia was the home or the platform for trade. And why can't we now take resume that center stage for trading in culture? Because we've got good Muslim brothers in West Asia that would feel comfortable with us. We have truly Asia, we have Chinese and Indians. We could bring in the big boys from China, the big boys in India as a neutral platform. So that's my big wish, my last big project, which is the Festival of Asia for Malaysia. I think what's interesting as well, I remember reading a while back that we also don't have much literature on our history as well. A lot of it was shared verbally and you really have to go and really research and meet the people who are living that life, hopefully who will still remember. I think we do. Mm -hmm. It's just that at the last... 20 years, culture has been dumbed down by Chitrawarna. I'm really against the idea of Chitrawarna. It's a dumbing down of culture. And I think the cultural appetite has become dumb. But like things like Rajalawa and it's a hee-hee-ha-ha -ha culture thing. More feathers, more sequins, carnival-like thing. But you look at how us be in Penang, we have Taipusam, we have Hungry Ghost. That's culture, that's tradition. We have traditional Malay rituals. There's beautiful traditional fabrics, rituals, performances. But we need to be relevant because if you don't, then the kids don't like it. I keep telling people that, why don't you do Borea with rap? Because Borea is social commentary of those days. And if you put rap there, it's social commentary. But find a middle ground where you introduce rap into Borea and then it'll make itself cultural relevant. Culture evolved too. What was mainstay culture became pop. Pop became culture, you know? What's interesting 
and I think it happens a lot throughout Malaysia as well, is that you have all these amazing people doing their trade, which they have probably inherited generation after generation. They're probably the last one because their younger kids don't want to do it anymore. It's not cool. It doesn't earn a lot of money. But how do you keep that alive? Because I don't think this 60, 70 year old uncles will want to learn how to rap to draw the no, younger crowd. No. No, it's the younger ones that need to, okay, say for instance, the beaded shoe, right? It's very hard. It takes you like six weeks to do a shoe or something like that. How do you really make it relevant? That's a, a, a difficult question. But the beauty of it does not fade. So I think if people put a price to beauty, a price to tradition, then handwork can come back. You look at the Japanese, how they learn 40, 50 years to be a master. You don't become a master until you learn the trade, like the Chinese too. But now people just want to do it fast. So the finesse of the work is gone. So I feel as if we have to, and it is there. It's just around us. And I'm, I'm beginning to feel that, my God, I was blinded too. I am now doing research. I'm playing homage to the, the older people who sang in Bakat TV and got second prize and people who dance and people who wrote beautiful things. I'm hoping to give them, uh, put them, uh, at least to archive them, like their contribution to the arts in Penang. And I think they were there before us and there's a lot to learn from the past. So it sounds very much like to ensure that the past and all that rich culture is preserved. We all have a part to play. We have to go out, learn it, be aware. Sometimes preserve is a, an old-fashioned word because you, mm. th you think of preservatives and putting it in blind. <laughs> I think we have to come up with a sexier word than preserve. I, I think we have to find a sexier word about culture has to be reinvented or something because in order for it to, to survive in its old form, it has to be repackaged. That's why I, I worship Royston Abel because... He was so clever in putting Sufi musicians in red box that reminded him of Red Light District in Amsterdam. And that visually was so entrancing. That, and yet the form was traditional Sufi musicians. So for me, that's clever. That's packaging. You don't change the art form, you change the packaging, the way it's been presented. So that I think is an art. If we can find a new way to present something in a contemporary way, because it's a contemporary audience that's out there. Because it's very hard for Mark Young. It's heavy for young people to understand it. So I think people need to really look at how, I don't have the answers. I hope I, I'll get to be able to play around with it for another 10 years. So for those listening, what do you think is the best way for people to support the arts? Buy tickets. I mean, if you think that you don't enjoy the arts, buy tickets for the young ones. Buy tickets for your nephews, nieces, or your children, because it's important for them to be exposed. If you by now at 30 don't like the arts, then forget about you. We don't want to change you. Start changing the 12 and 13-year-olds because they're going to take over the world. And I said, support a friend who's doing the arts. It's not easy. Buy tickets. Buy tickets, buy tickets, buy tickets, give, lend, loan, help, assist, do what you can, you know? Because a, a lot of people can support the artists and the, the system by, by giving, paying 15 ringgit or 20 ringgit for a ticket. But artists also must realize it's not charity. If you do bad shows and people pay 30 ringgit once, twice, the third time, they will never go and see an art show again. And you've just jeopardized every other performing group out there. So bad art have to go. And for artists, I imagine that having a community around them to bounce ideas off each other is so important. So if you are just starting out, you don't know anyone who's in the arts, what's the best way to go around and find like-minded people? Go to Clubhouse. I mean, it's so easy now. In the old days, you couldn't. You couldn't be into a space because you had to travel. Now look at Clubhouse, look at chat rooms, look at spaces, look at webinars and Zoom webinars. It is so easy for people to have access to creative people now where we never did. I mean, look at your podcast. There's hundreds of podcasts of very interesting people out there. Webinars and Zooms and Zoom webinars and talks. And Clubhouse is an interesting thing. I am so inspired because because I see young Malaysians, especially young Malays, who are liberal and yet religious. They can quote all the hadith. For a moment, I was really disheartened by how Malaysia is going. I felt, oh God, are we ever going to come out of this positive? And then I met these Malays online. And they are architects, they're designers, they're clever, knowledgeable, well-read. And they can quote the Quran and the hadith. And yet, they are liberal. And I think, my God, our country is with hope. And I'm like the old man in the room, you know, the bachi, you know. But I can tell you, it's really inspiring when you see good Malays out there wanting to change the country in a good way. I'm very glad that we're ending on such a positive note. So I normally love to end all of my interviews with this question. For the first one, it's, do you feel like you have found your why? Yes, I, at least on track. And what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? I'm a good son and I make people happy. What do you think are the most important qualities of a successful person? 
a good person, a meaningful person. I think these two words are very important, meaningful and good. So what if you're a festival director? If you're not a good person or a meaningful person, you know? so you're just being creative. But what's the value of creativity if it doesn't help people or make people happy? It can be eyebrow, okay, it challenges people to think. But at some point, there must be good there. There must be a piece of jigsaw that says good. And where can people go to connect with you, find out what you're doing, support everything? I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. It's either me, Joe Sidek, or Penang Arts Council, which is my new passion. Because I feel as if it's not about you and me, it's the power of we that can change the world. And Arts Council is a registered body, it's a non-profit body, and it's not an I word, it's a we word. So I decided to focus on that, to build this platform that it's going to be about a collective, it's about the we's of the world. And I think you're also on Clubhouse as well, so they can find you there. <laughs> yeah, well, I go in and then I'm, I'm getting a bit bored of it, but I still go in. And is there anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered yet? Two things. One is no anger, no ego, and no fear. Good things don't last, neither does bad things. <laughs>